Hello, hello, this is Joe from Nerd in Korea. We are doing our deck check-in number three now. Uh, this is Nelly Borka, impre uh, impulsive accuser, not impressive, impulsive. All right, so we are taking a look at Nelly Borka, impulsive accuser. This is group hug commander. So this is different than ones we've done before. This was built by one of my subscribers. Thank you, Frog. Yeah, thank you, Frog Hermit, for uh, building this and sending it to me. That's very helpful. Anyway, this deck is currently 8382 on TCG Player. And so, yeah, it's a very, it's this is by far the most uh, budget deck we've covered in this series so far. So, yeah, the first one I think was over 2000. And then the next one was over 800. So yeah, this is much more reasonable. <clears throat> so my thoughts on Nelly Borka. So this is a Boros commander, usually known for being highly aggressive, but this is more of a tricky commander and it's about manipulating combat and getting people to attacking each other rather than you. So this kind of sidesteps the normal tropes I think a lot of uh, Boros commanders fall into. Okay, Nelly Borka. Again, uh, Impulsive Accuser encourages or forces opponents to attack each other. Again, it's all about getting people to attack each other and not you. Rewards opponents for combat with other opponents. Okay, so let's look at her actual abilities. She's got Vigilance, which is always nice. And whenever Nelly Borka, Impulsive Accuser, attacks, suspect target creature, then go to all suspected target creature or go to all suspected creatures. So again, you want to get lots of suspect down when you can, and unfortunately that's a newer mechanic from uh, Murder Karlov Manor that doesn't have a whole lot of support yet, but Goad at least does. Goading is always good. Whenever one or more creatures and opponent controls deals combat damage to one or more of those opponents, you and the controller of those creatures each draw a card. So if, uh, if your opponent attacks another opponent and does damage, they draw a card and you draw a card. Card draw on a commander is just very, very good. It's something I always look for. And this is like very, like, I think it's easy to underestimate how good that is. Anyway. Key cards. So this deck is made to be fun for everyone at the table. So that's one thing I'd like to look at in these episodes is decks that are fun for like to play, not decks that really kind of like leech the fun out of the game, which I think there are plenty of, but anyway. The commander uses uh, goad and suspect, but dis <clears throat> but disincentivizing attacks is also key, right? So you are going to be goading and using suspect Again, Suspect gives the, basically Menace and makes it so they can't block. So you're making, making it so they can't block, which is very helpful to you, and giving them Menace, which is helpful for them attacking your opponents. This deck is also made with helping out as a key mechanic, okay? Helping out people is very good in general. For creating goodwill is a way to like win people over in the game, obviously. Political tool-wise, it's very good, and it also, like, can allow you to affect the balance of the game rather than like whoever has the you know the arch enemy dictating the game so yeah defense first of all ghostly prison uh norn's annex and windborn muse okay i'm gonna talk about these three together first this is the pillow fort strategy most people know pillow fort and anyway so basically, if a creature attacks you, its controller has to pay two mana, and then for Norn's Annex, they can pay two mana or two life. Or, sorry, two white or two life, not two mana. Or, no, one white per creature. Ugh, okay. Anyway, I've got Windborn Muse and Ghostly Prison has two in my head. Windborn Muse basically does the same thing as Ghostly Prison. Creatures can't attack you unless their controller pays two for each creature they have they control that's attacking you. All right, so this one, those unfortunately do not protect your uh, planeswalkers. So if you do have those, they're going to be open for attack. But I don't think this deck does, so it's okay. Um, 
Having even two of these on the battlefield makes it extremely difficult to attack you with even like two or more creatures. Pers the person has to say, okay, do I want to cast that spell or do I don't want to attack them? The disincentive, the disincentive is huge with that. Also with Norn Xanax, maybe they don't, they can't spare the life and uh, they don't have the white. Basically, if they don't have white mana, they've got to be paying life to attack you, which is not something people want to do, I think. Mangara, the Diplomat, so whenever an opponent attacks with the creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and or Planeswalkers you control, draw a card. Okay, this is not really something that I think most people put a lot of stock in, but when, as Dins' incentives go, being like, oh, if I attack this person with two creatures, they draw a card, a lot of times that'll be enough to be like, oh, I'll attack someone else, right? This is Commander, it, there, there are three opponents, right? If you get a card draw out of it and they're taking a risk, they're just going to attack someone else, usually. So yeah, I think that is a very good card for that. And Aurelia, the Law Above, Whenever a player attacks with three or more creatures, draw a card. When, whenever a player attacks with five or more creatures, uh, it deals three damage to each of your opponents and you gain three life. That's crazy, right? You are goading, and when creatures are goaded, they're forced to attack. They have to attack someone other than you. So you're going to be forcing a bunch of your opponent's creatures to attack someone else, and be, from that you're going to get a bunch of, yeah, not exactly a defense card, but it's like defense synergy card. At least defense how we have defense here, it's synergy with that. So that's why I really love this. And uh, even, yeah, being able, getting the extra card draw is already quite good. And um, doing damage and gaining life from other people fighting, that's crazy good. That's just, oh boy. Opponents fight. Okay, Agitator Ant. Again, this is like rewarding someone for, actually I'll do the, yeah. These both reward your opponents for not attacking you. Basically they can put two plus one plus one counters on the creature, and that creature is essentially goaded and has to attack someone else. So you're buffing up your opponent's creatures, but they can only go attack someone else then. Or at least for that turn they can, but it's, yeah, very, very useful. Uh, combat Calligrapher, whenever a player attacks with one or, more one or more of your opponents, that attacking player creates a tapped two and one white and black inkling creature token with flying that's attacking that opponent. Okay, so this sounds like it's bad, but remember, Inklings can attack you or Planeswalkers you control. So you're giving them an extra attacker, basically, an extra flying attacker, but that attacker can attack you. So once again, it's like rewarding them for attacking someone else. Attacking another opponent, you get basically an extra attack out of it. That's, again, the synergy there is just crazy. Especially with uh, Arulia. Remember, if it's three or five, you get bonuses, and uh, this is going to be an extra, putting extra bodies into combat, basically. So yeah, it'll add up fast. Brash Taunter. Okay, this is not really like forcing your opponents to fight, but this is causing damage to an opponent. If an opponent attacks you, and they don't have like flying or evasion or something, and you block with Brash Taunter, they're taking the damage, right? So yeah, it's uh, basically making them punch themselves. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting, I think an interesting way of looking at that. But anyway, and Gisela, Blade of Gold Knight, uh, if a source would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent an opponent controls, that source deals double that damage to that player or permanent instead. So all of your opponents are just doing double damage to each other and not to you. Oh, oh, oh. And if a source would deal damage to you or a permanent you control, prevent half of that damage rounded up. So you're preventing half or just over half the damage if it's hitting you or any of your opponents, 
and if they decide to attack someone else, they get double damage. So do they want double damage or half damage? Oh, 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 oh. I, I think double probably, right? Helping people out. So we've been talking a lot about getting opponents to fight each other, but this deck is also very good at helping people out. So Loran of the First Path. Um, so when she enters the battlefield, destroy one target artifact or enchantment. Removal is always great as an ETB. It's, she's only three, so the removal is not like super expensive on top of the creature. But also you could tap her and you and target opponent each draw a card. This kind of political card is so useful because you can be like, hey, you know I can help you out if you don't, you know, mess with me kind of thing. And uh, yeah, Secret Rendezvous, same thing, basically. You and target opponent each draw three cards. This is what I mentioned before as well, where it's like, if one player is falling behind and another player is getting way ahead, you can really even it out just by giving them card draw. Tenuous Truce. Basically rewarding someone for not attacking you long term. At the beginning of Enchanted Player's End Step, you and that player each draw a card. So you each get to draw an extra card as long as the, you don't attack each other. When you attack Enchanted Opponent or in a Planeswalker they control, or when they attack you or a Planeswalker you control, sacrifice Tenuous Truth. So again, just rewarding people for leaving you alone. Great, great card. I gotta start putting this in text, I think. Cut a deal. Each opponent draws a card, then you draw a card for each opponent who drew a card this way. Just a whole bunch of extra card draw. Duelist Heritage. Okay, this is one where I think you, I, a lot of people probably read it and don't read it correctly, but anyway. Whenever one or more creatures attack, Okay, so this is every single combat. It's not just your combat. It's not creatures you control. It's whenever creatures, one or more creatures attack, you may have target attacking creature gain double strike until end of turn. Usually you'd only want to use this on your own creatures, but this gives you a lot of like, again, playing kind of politics, giving you a lot of control over what happens. Uh, especially if they're doing double damage and you give them double strike, it's uh, whew, a lot, a lot. Control combat, all right? You wanna be able to, you're causing a lot of combat, you wanna be able to control that as well. Thundersong Trumpeteer, target creature can't attack or block this turn. Keep Being able to keep something out of combat, especially like a goaded creature. If one of your opponents wants to keep their creature alive, but it's gonna go into combat and kill itself, you can be like, hey, you know what? I'll keep it out of combat. Which, you're forcing them into combat, but it's still nice to do that. Also, when you want to attack, taking out the blocker is, uh, is a good thing. Laser Screwdriver. This is, it works as a mana rock, and also for three, and tap, goad target creature. So you can just keep goading creatures using this as well. This is an ability, remember, you can wait until someone else's turn and then use this, right? When it's about to go to their combat, use this, right? When they're about to start combat and declare attackers, and that way you can see that, oh, is that guy going to attack me? That could be a problem. Now it's got to attack someone else. Rogue's Passage. Again, it is target creature, not creature you control. So again, adding one uh, colorless or for four and tap, target creature can't be blocked this turn. You can get, give someone else just like a free shot, basically. That's really incredible and not something that you'd usually look at this card and go, oh, of course, I'll let my opponents, you know, get free shots on each other. Uh, not something you usually think of, but in this deck, it's very good for that. Requisition Raid. Okay, so you do have the target removal, which is very nice. Destroy artifact or destroy enchantment or both. Remember with Spree, you can do both. And put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature target player controls. 
So you can use this on someone else's units. All of their stuff. You can go to their stuff and then buff it. And then they're just like going to be doing a pile of extra damage that combat. Labyrinth of Skophos. Uh, again, the four and remove... Uh, Four and tap, sorry. Remove target attacking or blocking creature from combat. This is very useful just for like limiting their options once again. Like if you have this untapped and enough mana, they'll probably go, oh, I won't even bother. Because, you know, he's just going to take it out of combat. You'll just, yeah, be like, no, go home. And then they go home or they get lost in the labyrinth, I guess. Remember, turn left. Anyway, the plan. How does this deck play? Um, step one, in the mana base. Usually, I think all of these decks, step one is some version of mana base. Step two, incentivize attacks. Step three, win con. <clears throat> so mana base, we've got... Oh. Shiny Impetus, and I love this in this deck because it's like, you care about goad so much. And this is goading a creature, and whenever that creature attacks, you make a treasure. So you're getting extra mana from forcing your opponents to attack, which is what you want to do anyway. It, it just, in this, it's extra shiny in this one. But anyway, Curse of Opulence. This is always... Uh, this is just a fantastic card. It has crashed in price recently. It should not have. I don't understand. But anyway. Whenever an enchanted player is attacked, create a gold token. Each opponent attacking that player does the same. So, again, basically it's a treasure. Right? Gold token treasure. I, I, I don't know why they call it something different, but they did. Keeper of the Accord. Again, at the beginning of each end step, if the, if that player controls more uh, creatures than you, make a 1-1 one, one soldier. And if they control more lands than you, you may search your library for a basic planes card, put it on the battlefield, tap, then shuffle. Boros, one of the major problems is you don't have green, you don't have land ramp, right? This is your land ramp. This is just catching you up. So hopefully someone at the table is playing green and is getting those extra land drops. At the end of every one of their turns, you're just going to keep, like, for free, sneaking things into the battlefield. It's, <laughs> it's really fun. Smuggler Sharer. Okay, draw a card uh, at the beginning of each end step. Draw a card if, for each opponent who drew two or more cards this turn. Then create a treasure token for each... Uh, opponent who had two or more land to enter the battlefield under their control this turn. Keeper of the Accord and Smuggler share together. Just a scary, scary combination. Finally, Cursed Mirror. Alright, it's a mana rock you can tap for a red. Also, when it enters the battlefield, it may become a copy of a creature on the battlefield until end of turn, except it has haste. This is Commander, right? There's going to be all kinds of cards with all kinds of, or sorry, all kinds of creature cards with all kinds of useful abilities. So if you don't see something you uh, don't want to copy, maybe wait a turn. Probably yeah, there's going to be something you can at least make a decent use out of, right? So this is a very, very good commander card in particular. Incentivizing attacks. This is something we actually went over already, so I'm not going to go over it all over again, but yeah. Kind of this the same cards I already showed you and talked about earlier. Are, uh, and there's a lot more in this deck as well. So yeah, this is not the limit, that's for sure. Win con issue. This deck does not have a sudden win con. This is something the deck builder raised as an issue. I think it is more than able to win already. The deck already has several finishers. So this is much more combat oriented deck. It's not really about like something being like, ah, oh, I win. I think this is much more about like, yeah, getting the combat damage in and stuff like that. And it is very, very good at that. So finisher number one, Taunt from the Ramparts. Again, go to all creatures your opponents control until, the next, until your next turn. Those creatures can't block. 
Okay, so basically no blocking for a turn. That's, uh, you can kind of just like, as long as you got some creatures on the battlefield, you can hopefully just win right there. And if you can't do it in one combat, you've got Great Train Heist, which also has Spree. And for four, untap all creatures you control. It, uh, if it's your combat phase, there's an additional combat phase after this one. So go in, attack with everything, do the damage, cast this, untap everything, do it again. Just, just, no oh boy. If you can't do it in two attacks, then I don't know. I don't know. You should. You should. Finisher number two. <clears throat> Hot Pursuit. This is an enchantment. So when it enters the battlefield, suspect target creature an opponent controls as long as Hot Pursuit remains on the battlefield. That creature is also goaded. Again, suspect and goad. The two things we want in this deck. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if two or more players have lost the game, gain control of all goaded and or suspected creatures until end of turn, untap them, they gain haste until end of turn. So you're just taking control that the main limitation is uh, of goad is once you're to one on one, goad doesn't work anymore, right? Goad says you have to attack another opponent. If there isn't another opponent, goad just switches off basically, right? This keeps Goad functional. It also makes better use of Suspect, so that's great too, but yeah. You're just stealing, quite possibly, all the creatures on the board, and then you can march in with them. For instance, Life of the Party. First strike, trample, haste. Whenever Life of the Party attacks, it gets plus X plus zero until end of turn where X is the number of creatures you control. So, excuse me, all those creatures that you stole? you get bonus, a big bonus for all of them. And when Life of the Party enters the battlefield, if it's not a token, each opponent creates a token that's a copy of it. The tokens are goaded for the rest of the game. So this is gonna make a whole bunch of tokens and even if you're 1v1 and they only have one of these and you have one, you're taking control of that and everything else and you're getting huge bonus to damage with trample and first strike oh 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 anywho that's actually a pretty cheap one too right that's two for hot pursuit and uh four for life of the party a finisher for six mana that's uh pretty good finisher number three mob rule so gain control of all creatures with power 4 or greater until end of turn, untap them, you gain haste. Or gain control of all creatures with power 3 or less, tap them, they gain haste. Untap them, they gain haste. And yeah. Return the favor is what I want to look at with this. Once again, another spree card. Copy target instant spell, sorcery spell, activated ability, blah 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 blah. Doesn't matter. You're t copying this sorcery, right? So you you make cast ro mob rule, steal all the or all the creatures of whatever, then copy it, cast it again. This time, steal the other half, right? So you're just stealing all the creatures on the board with this. That then they don't have blockers. Then they don't have you know. That's just you taking control of the whole board and like smashing. And if that doesn't end it, I don't know what will. Keep in mind, yeah, the purpose of the de deck should be kept in mind when talking about suggestions. Uh, this deck was built on a budget that is good at forcing opponents to attack each other and be able to help out each, uh, <clears throat> sorry, be able to help out other players. All right, so this is not just about like, you know, aggression. This is also about being able to help out and cause some goodwill and to have fun, right? Here I am looking to upgrade cards that serve the same general purpose and fall under what I consider to be budget. So two bucks or less on TCG player, not a sponsor, or at least a reduction in cost. So one card here I'm suggesting to change is not, the suggested change is not a budget card, but it's much, much cheaper. Here I'm going to explore some cards that may add 
or may be added to enhance the usefulness of particular mechanics. So I'm actually a little bit more broad than what I've done before. I'm saying like, maybe we should use more of these mechanics and yeah, we'll see. Replaceable cards, Cathartic Reunion. It's a good card, but I look at it as like discarding two to draw three, that's okay, but if you have the two to discard, do you really want to draw three? It's like, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Faithless Looting. This is a very, very good card as well. Um, kind of the same thing with Cathartic Re Reunion. Card draw is not the problem with this deck, right? You don't need a lot of extra card draw when your commander already has card draw and you have a bunch of other card draw. Like, how many cards do you want to have in your hand? A uh, Curse of the Stock Prey. So whenever, uh, again, this is a curse that if they attack with a creature, uh, it does, yeah. You can put a plus one, plus one counter on that creature. If they actually do damage to the player. Again, it, it's okay, but we have similar effects in the deck already. I feel like there are better options and we have stuff that does similar already, so eh. Winnow, uh, destroy target non-land permanent if another permanent with the same name is in play and draw a card. Um, in a lot of formats, this would be a really, really good card. In this, just in Commander, again, it just has to be a non-land card, so um, uh, you're hoping that there's two of these big threats on the board at the same time? I, I don't I don't see that being very likely. A different removal would be better, I think, in general. And Worn Power Stone. Um, again, this is all right, but it, it enters the battlefield tapped. It's basically expensive soul ring, but it enters tapped and uh, costs more mana. Eh, you know, yeah, not my favorite. Anyway, Warm Power Stone, I would switch with Spectral Spotlight. Choose a player, that player adds one mana of any color they choose. Again, with the helping out people sub-theme in the deck, this is great. We've got lots of card draw, you can help people draw cards. Now you can give them mana too. Really, if someone's in a tight spot, this might be exactly what they need as well, so yeah. Uh, Winnow, I already talked about that, I'd switch with Dawn Charm, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn, or regenerate target creature, or counter target spell that targets you. White counter spells, first of all, very very good things to have, white's not good at that usually, and also yeah, being able to negate all the combat damage, if someone actually does get through and do a bunch of damage to you, you can just be like, no, the, we're just not going to count that. Uh, yeah. Also, just having options in general is amazing. Curse of the Stock uh, of the Stock Prey for Decanter of Endless Water. Again, you have no maximum hand size. That's one thing I feel like this deck does need. Cards that give no maximum hand size. That's probably number one priority I see. This has so much card draw, I would not worry about more card draw. I'd be like, make sure you're not just discarding a whole bunch of cards, right? Faithless Looting, I would uh, switch to Pirate's Pillage, which you have to discard a card for, of course. But anyway. Draw two, then discard two. It's good, but at the same time, you need a decent sized hand to make that really worthwhile, and you need things you don't mind discarding to make it worthwhile. Um, I would prefer to, yeah, discard one and draw two. And this also makes two treasure tokens, right? You get two, it is more expensive, it's three and a red rather than just one red. You discard one less card and you make two treasure tokens. In a way, you can think about it like you're paying to convert the mana into treasure tokens. I think then you look at it and say, oh, it's one and a red then. If it's too colorless, being converted into the... Anyway, you get my point, yeah. Cathartic Reunion, I would switch with Thought Vessel. Once again, 
that no maximum hand size that is especially when you're probably going to have so much card draw i think a lot of games you're going to end up going like oh no it's the end of my turn and i've got to chuck all these cards i don't want to right not anymore you don't finally oh we are to that super expensive or maybe not it's not fair to call it a super expensive card but the most expensive card in the deck by far is trouble in pairs okay so if an opponent would begin an extra turn that player skips that turn instead that's so useful like if it comes up it will like make the difference right if they start getting extra turns they're probably just gonna win this is gonna like can save your butt maybe maybe and whenever an opponent attacks you with two or more creatures draws the second card each turn or cast the second spell each turn you draw a card again a lot more card draw do we need more uh, it's this is a very very good card i'm not saying it's not it absolutely is uh does it really fit into this deck though i'm on the fence about that i think it's a good card for the deck don't get me wrong but anyway 25 16 for that keep in mind the whole deck is like what just over 80 dollars so this is like a quarter over a quarter of the price of the deck is in this one card is it really worth it i would instead put in bayloth barrel entertainer this is one that went up and i thankfully was like i know this is going to go up so i got i think i got three of them i should have ordered more but yeah i'm always like doubting that it's actually going to go up i guess um creatures your opponent's control with power less than bayloth barrels are power are goaded so once again you're just even when you first play him he's goading everything with power two or lower right and just to make sure oh less than okay one or lower one or lower right so if you can start putting counters on him that's where he starts to like get out of control you could just have the if you know throw a couple equipment on him or something and uh or plus one plus one counters and he's just going to be like a monster everyone is going to have to attack each other every turn and that's only eight dollars and 96 cents so again <clears throat> i think this fits better with the deck overall and yeah just the usefulness is huge also being less than half the price is uh definitely a win there too <clears throat> i'm getting all dry here okay one thing this deck is lacking is recursion so yeah brought back sun titan and leave chance are all great cards for just getting things back particularly this card has what is it called vandal blast vandal blast and a lot of artifact ramp right vandal blast if you cast it first overload destroys all artifacts including yours if you're not careful you'd probably end up just like wiping out a large amount of your own mana space this is going to let you at least like get some of that back the leave in particular return any number of target permanents you own to your hand so yeah before you actually activate your uh if you're going to cast that before you actually do it tap them for mana return them to your hand hopefully you also have you know unlimited uh unlimited cards in hand no maximum hand size that's what i was trying to say and then uh yeah vandal blast away what do you care right you can put all your stuff nice and safe into your hand and then just blow up everyone else's stuff anywho the main mechanic i want to add to this is monarch there is court of grace i believe is already on here but let's look at some of the others that i think can really you can really get a lot of value out of because you are constantly getting people to attack each other and not you monarch is just such a good fit for this deck i think <clears throat> 
So once again, when you're the monarch, you draw an extra card at the end of your turn. So those are your more card draw. So Court of Ardenville, at the beginning of your upkeep, return target permanent card with value, amount of value three or less from your graveyard to your hand. If you're the monarch, return the permanent card to the battlefield. So you're just taking things out of your graveyard, putting them straight back in the battlefield, as long as you're the monarch. Nuts. Court of Ire. You can automatically do two damage to any target. If you're the monarch, it deals seven damage instead. Seven automatic damage is a lot. And I think you can very easily maintain the monarch, right? You can be the monarch pretty safely, I think, every turn. Ember Wild Captain. So once again, it makes you the monarch. And whenever an opponent attacks you while you're the monarch, it Ember Wild Captain deals damage to that player equal to the number of cards in their hand. So even, yeah, if they've got a decent sized hand and you're the monarch, probably just gonna leave you alone again. It's <laughs> the synergy, oh my. Skyline Despot. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning of your upkeep, if you're the monarch, create a 5-5 five, five dragon creature token with flying. You just start putting these 5-5 five, five flyers down, right? Oh, oh, oh. I'm getting this for another deck, actually. Palace Jailer, uh, once again, makes you the monarch, and um, you can exile a target creature to put it controls until the be an opponent becomes the monarch. Okay, so you're gonna exile something, and then as long as you're the monarch, it just stays exiled. This is great to use against like commanders, for instance. A lot of times if people, you know, if you just say you're gonna exile the commander, they'll just put it back to the command zone. If you do something like this, and Oh, once I'm not Monarch anymore, you get to come out of, uh, you know, the Jailer's gonna let him out or whatever, then uh, they're more likely to be like, okay, fine, I'll just put in Exile. You know, temporarily, and temporarily ends up being permanently, probably. Anywho. Final thought. So this is another deck that is made with fun in mind. So that is one thing I am trying to focus on in this, is like, decks that are fun, right? decks that actually people enjoy playing against. I, there are too many decks where it is really just like, I think that's kind of like a trope with MTG even, is that it's like grown, this commander grown, this card grown, you know? Instead, this is like more fun, I think. It does get people attacking each other, which may not be to their game plan, but it also rewards them for attacking, okay? So it is, forcing your opponents to attack, but it rewards them as well. So it, it doesn't, it's not like adding salt kind of thing. Anyway, when people are doing more, the game is more interesting. I think it does make the game a lot more fun using mechanics like goad and stuff like that because people just keep doing stuff. Magic is only really boring when it's like, I do this, 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 and everyone's just kind of only playing on their own battlefield almost, and then passing, passing, passing. When people are constantly just having to swing at each other, it makes for a very interesting, fun, and lively game. Alright, so I think that's one thing that this commander in this deck is particularly good at, but anyway, take it easy.